with me this morning. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's with us this morning. It fills us to full, God. Just invite you to just lift your hands, lift your hearts to the Lord this morning. God, we just respond this morning to who you are, to the glory that's due to your name. God, I pray that it would be more than just lips, or just words on our lips this morning. God, it would be the song of our heart that comes out. That would be, we would be mindful of you and the folks around us this morning, that we sing over one another, that we bring our faith and join it together. Because God, we know you are with us. Where two or three are gathered, you, there you are, God. And we believe it this morning. If you believe that, can you say amen? God's so good. He's faithful, he's just, and he's true this morning. We're going to declare that.
Pour it out, Jesus. Pour it out. Only you are worthy. Only you are worthy, God. Only you deserve it, Lord. Only you deserve it, God. It's your breath. Yes. 
be appropriate this morning just to give space to respond to the Lord. He just spoke over us. If you just take 30 seconds and just pray a prayer to the Lord. Let him do what he said. Let him fix those broken spots. Let him have access to the places that you close off. prayer, Jesus. We do love you. You just say this. Say, Jesus, I love you with my whole heart. We do, God. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Bennett, uh, lead pastor here. I'm privileged to pastor our church with a group of elders who love our church well, who shepherd our church, I think, pretty well. And um, it is good to be with you. It is good to see your faces. Um, somebody was telling me the day that was like coming back to church was like returning after like the Thanos snap. You know, it was like weird to be with everybody again. And um, um, if you're a Marvel fan, we're there. We go. That's right. So. Um, Hey, we are going to be doing something a little bit different today. We did this a couple of months ago. We are covering a text this morning. We're in the book of Acts. And uh, we're covering Acts chapter 10, uh, from chapter 10 all the way to 11, verse 18. That's a bunch of verses. And so today what we're going to do is we've got several readers who are going to read that text this morning. And so in a few minutes after I make a couple of uh, comments and announcements, 
Um, I'm going to invite you not to stand today. Usually we stand for the reading of God's word. This text is pretty lengthy. And rather than you fighting, you know, your legs while we're standing, I would rather you absorb this in your heart. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll get there in just a second. Um, again, welcome to Renewal, everybody. Um, if you are new to our church and you would like to know more about our church, um, I'm available after service. Um, we've got some folks who will be standing in the back who are also available. You can go to our website, renewalmemphis.com, and uh, just sort of surf there and uh, find out information about us. And uh, if you have questions, follow-up questions or anything, questions regarding what it looks like to be a member here, um, if you are coming to faith in Jesus and you would like to be baptized, to fully immerse yourself in the life of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, if you have any questions whatsoever, like maybe how to get involved in one of our, what we, our small groups we call renewal communities here. And so we have communities that meet all over the city and uh, groups of people who gather together for a meal and they encourage one another and build each other up in their faith. Um, if you have questions about any of that stuff, maybe you are in a really, really dark place in your life and you need help, you need counsel, you need advice, you need, your soul needs shepherding. We want to do that for you. Please don't suffer alone. We want to be with you through this. And so just reach out to us. You can send an email. Uh, this sounds pretty impersonal, but it's going to get to a real person. Info at RenewalMemphis.com. That's info at RenewalMemphis.com. Also, uh, for those of you who are uh, consistent contributors or even every once in a while contributors, thank you. Uh, we appreciate your generosity to our church. And uh, if you'd like to give this morning... You can simply go to our website, RenewalMemphis.com, or you can give uh, through your cell phone. You can just dial 84321. That's 84321, and uh, you can give that way. So thanks again, everybody. Um, just a couple, just a, we're in, the, we're in the book of Acts, and um, the reason why we're in the book of Acts and we're taking our time to go through the book of Acts is because my prayer, my, literally my daily prayer, is that our church would be renewed in seeing ourselves in this book. Um, we all come here, many of us are, have grown up in different churches, and so we all bring different assumptions about what church is and how it should be. Um, I think it's important that we get on the same page and that everybody in our church has a general understanding of why there is such a thing called church. Um, what God wants to do through his church. And one of the big themes that we've learned throughout the book of Acts so far is that the church is the people of God. They are God's holy people. And God planted his holy people all over this planet in expressions of the church. The church is the people of God. The church is not renewal church or central or fellowship or Christ Methodist. The church is the people of God, people who have come to faith in Jesus. We are all part of the church the moment we are born again, the moment the Spirit enters our, enter, enters our lives and we have faith in Jesus. But we live that out by being a part of a local community of believers, people that we can practice the faith with. And so the question is, what are we practicing? What is the end goal of our practice? And the overarching end goal of our practice is that God has put his holy people on this earth to proclaim his word, to make disciples, and to bring about transformation in people's lives individually and in our world corporately. That's why God has put us here. And so today we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. Um, this is a significant and uh, um, hinge moment in the book of Acts. And I didn't want to break this up over four or five or six weeks. I wanted to cover the entire story, the entire narrative in one fell swoop. And so I've got four readers who are going to be coming up here in just a moment. Um, but I want to just give you just a, a bit of context for what we're jumping into this morning. Um, we've been studying over the last few weeks the conversion and the ministry of this man named Saul, who became known as Paul. His name was changed to Paul, and he's the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. And it's sort of an abrupt change because we learned all about Peter for the first few chapters of Acts, and then we jumped to Paul, you know, 
you know, we slammed on the brakes and we went to Paul. And then we slam on the brakes and we go back to Peter in Acts chapter 10. And actually at the end of Acts chapter 9. And at the end of Acts chapter 9, you see Peter. He's traveling all around the region of Israel. And he's going from church to church, strengthening the disciples. I imagine he's teaching them spending time with them. In fact, he would go and hang out at their houses and, and, and sleep in their homes and be with them and meet with them and have gatherings with them and teach them and encourage them. And he would also do incredible things. Uh, there was this church in this town called Joppa. Joppa is on the Mediterranean Sea. It's kind of close to modern day Tel Aviv. And he was called by this small community of disciples, primarily made up of widows. And one of their beloved fellow members had died. Her name was Tabitha. Tabitha was a seamstress. And she was, must have been just deeply grieved and, and was mourned over by this church because they sent two men to find Peter and bring Peter to the house where her body lay. And he went there and he healed her. He raised her up. And um, just an incredible thing. And then you're going to notice, as we read the story this morning, that there is this Roman military leader who's in charge of Caesarea or Caesarea. Or, uh, there's a big debate on how to say that right, but uh, something like that. And he's, he's on the coast in Caesarea, and this is a big coast that's important to the Romans because it's through this coast, through this seaport, that a lot of the wheat that was harvested in Egypt was brought up to this coast and sent back to Rome. So a hugely important economic place for the Roman Empire. And this man named Cornelius is in charge. He's the military leader in charge. And yet, he's not your typical military leader, it sounds like. He didn't, he didn't despise the Jews and look down on them and mistreat them. In fact, he gave alms to the Jews. And he loved the Jews. And the Jews appreciated him. They really appreciated him. And he has this vision. And in this vision, we're going to read about in just a moment, He's told to go summon Peter to leave Joppa and come to his house, and that's what happens. Peter struggled with this, and this is just this, this little, little bit of info I want to make sure we have here so that we understand what we're absorbing this morning. Peter was told through a vision to go to Cornelius' house, but he was told in a very abstract way. He saw this strange image of animals that, according to Jewish law, were unlawful to eat, and yet God told him, eat, Peter. Eat them. And Peter said, God, I can't believe you would tell me this. What I, one of the things I love about the apostles is they could actually hear God tell them things that they didn't agree with. I love that about the apostles. Most people, when they talk about hearing God, they hear the things they already agree with. I find that really interesting. But Peter could hear things that he totally rejected. Theologically were repugnant to him. He heard God tell him that. And so the reason why that was such a test for Peter was because the people of God, the Jews, the children, the descendants of Abraham, were especially chosen by God. God chose Abraham and all of his descendants, and he preserved them. He preserved their culture, not just for the sake of their culture, but he preserved their way of life. Or maybe it's better, it's better said this way. He preserved their distinctiveness as his people, by assigning them particular laws and practices, both concerning ceremonial activities and also the way they even ate their food. And this set them apart as a peculiar and unique people. You fast forward all the way to the time of Peter in the early church, and this was the assumption that the first Christians had. That if someone who was not a Jew came to faith in Jesus, that's great, but they have to adopt all of our Jewish ways, the way that we eat and all the other peculiar things that we do. At this point, the apostles still sort of believe this. They weren't clear on this. So keep in mind here, these are men who followed Jesus for three years, sat under his teaching. These were men, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus revealed his glory to them. He revealed his glory to them on the Mount of Transfiguration. They watched Jesus heal the sick and raise the dead. 
They went to seminary and their only professor was Jesus Christ. That's pretty legit. After that, they saw Jesus die and suffer, buried, and they saw him be raised from the dead. They witnessed him in his resurrected form. And still, their theology, their the, 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 how do I say that? Theology was a little bit wonky and inconsistent when it came to people who were outsiders who were not Jews. I want to challenge us to find some humility here. Many times we settle into stubborn and concrete categories, and we come by this honestly because it gives us a sense of security. It helps us to make sense of a world that feels chaotic and threatening. And so if we can find a category that makes sense of the world, it gives us a sense of peace. That's not bad necessarily. It's just when those categories contradict and rebel against the ways of God. This is where Peter was in this text. Peter needed the Spirit of God to be a hugely disruptive force in his life. He needed to be shocked, jolted, water thrown in his face, rudely awakened. He needed that in his life. And the Spirit was kind enough to do that. And so that's where we are this morning. So I'm going to invite my, my firstborn to come and begin. And I want to invite all of you guys to follow along in your Bibles. If you have a Bible, if not, come on, Maya. Uh, this is my beautiful first, firstborn, Maya. Come on up here, Maya. Everybody, everybody give a big hand to Maya. Man, I love this kid made me a daddy. And so, um, so she's going to start. And, um, and I want to invite you guys to just absorb this. Don't wait for me to get up at the end and say something super interesting. The most important part of this service is the word of God. I'm going to say some things at the end, but absorb this. Don't let your mind wander if you can. If you struggle with your mind wandering, maybe just make some notes. Make some observations. I want you to keep track of what you're feeling as you hear this read aloud. Keep track of the feelings that you have that are positive. Keep track of the feelings that you have and the thoughts that you have are negative. Bring all that to God. You don't have to bring, I heard a podcast this week, you don't have to bring an avatar to God. The person that you think should say and believe all the right things. Bring who you are to God today and give that to him and allow his presence and his word to do work in your life. So, Without any further ado, we're going to begin with Acts chapter 10. Maya's going to read verses 1 through 16. Then we've got, we've got three other people who are going to come read. There's going to be about a 30-second break between each reading, not just to create a sense of awkwardness here, but just to, give you a, just to give you a few moments to think, absorb, ponder, and then the next person will come up and read. And then again, I'll come up at the end, and we'll wrap it up today. So, all right. At Caesarea, <clears throat> there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius! And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now, send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again and said a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. 
This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited the men to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied them. And on the following day they entered Caesarea, Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why do you sent for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Dapa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commended by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
and they asked Peter to remain for some days. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheep descending being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was thrown up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Day. Um, and the first one is this, and I, I would like you to just try to think about this, ponder this for a few moments. As you think back over this text, well, actually, let's do this first. Let's take a minute, and I want you in your mind to think back over the text. Tell the story to yourself. Would you do that? Not out loud, just retell the story to yourself. Try to remember every detail.
Okay. I'd like to make a couple of comments and then ask you another question. Ask you to do something else. Um, people often lament that they don't know how to study the scriptures. A few years ago, what if somebody would have said, hey, how do I do that? I would have immediately just launched into, we'll do this, 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 and this. And I've learned that you can't start there. I've learned that we have to start with being fully present with God before I can tell you what to do. And in my opinion, one of the greatest threats to transformation in our lives is our addiction to stimulation. Because we are always going, I mentioned this last week, I think, we are always going to our devices, to technology, to whatever, social media, something, for that hit of dopamine so that we can feel something. And to carve out spaces of silence where there's no striving, no performance, no end goal of achievement, just to be with God. That is one of the biggest challenges we face in making disciples. And when I'm and, and it, to be clear, when I say making disciples, I'm talking about people who are being transformed by God. And so today, we're doing this thing with Acts, but there's something else going on here too. We're learning how to stop and be with God. You don't have to make anything happen. Again, there's no expectation to achieve something. It's just being with God. Reading the text, maybe reading it again, and taking a few moments to stop and review it in my mind. Just let it wash over me. Always fighting to turn off that expectation to make God do something. Rather, just being with him. Um, maybe an analogy would help. Um, a date night with my wife or a hangout with one of my kids It's going to feel really hollow if my goal is to create some outcome. If my goal is to in, elicit some behavior from them for my benefit. To try to get them to do something. Rather, just being together. Just being together. For many of us, the call to discipleship is the call to stop. Stop running. Stop grinding. Stop. And be with him. In, in a setting like this, you can do this alone. Just a caveat there. Question. What do we learn about God in this text? What does this tell us about God? Let's take 30 seconds and think about that. Just see if you can find one thing in your heart this says about God. What does this reveal about God? Who he is? What he's like?
All right. Any takers? In one sentence, not like a Pauline sentence with 12 commas, but one sentence, what, what can you tell? What, what, what does this say about God? What's that? He speaks to us. What's that? He can change the rules. <laughs> he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> he what? He wants all people to come to him. He has a plan. What's that, Helen? He's no respecter of persons. He doesn't privilege people over anyone else. Is that what you're saying? Somebody was saying it. Going to say something over here. Whoa. Wait a second. When he speaks to us, it's not always for us. It may be for somebody else. I don't get anything out of this. What's that? Peter got stuff out. Yeah, he did. I totally agree with you. I'm just kidding. So, He what? He wants to involve us in his plan. It's pretty good stuff. John? Oh, man. Took us to a whole other level. Say that again, John. He challenges us in ways that make us vulnerable to others. Hmm. He takes us out of our box. God is like so anti-box. Have you noticed that about God? Wow. He wants relationship with us. And out of that relationship, he wants us to have relationship with everyone else. Did I say that right? He breaks down things that divide us. Or he wants to. I totally agree. He wants to. Because we've got to submit to that, right? Anything else? Hmm. He wants us to know what pleases him and brings him glory. Amen. What else do we learn about God? He uses nature to teach us. <laughs> That's all over scripture, yeah. The heavens declare the glory of God. Somebody over here was going to say something? No person is uncommon or unclean. What? Nobody? Are you sure? Okay, I totally agree. No person is uncommon or unclean. Hmm. What does this text say about us? The good, the bad, the ugly. What, is it, what does it say about us? Let's take 30 seconds. We're not ready for that yet. Let's take 30 seconds and think about it. What does this text say about people? People. All right, let's try that again. What does this text say about people? Yeah. Would you say that one more time, Martin? My paraphrase, 
tell me if I'm right here, rather than being a consumer of God's goods, take that and bring that to other people. Reach out to them. Did I, was that it, basically? Anybody else? What does this say about people? Mm. Often our hearts are resistant to his will. Is that true of anybody in here? I'm not patronizing you. Like, can, can we acknowledge if that's true of us? Robert, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> what else does this say about people? Proud. People are hungry for the truth. Hmm. Mm. Say that one more time. That people who love Jesus a lot, even they have, do have prejudices and biases, and that only God himself can break those, mm. have to actively ask for that. Yeah. People who really, for those of you watching online, for people who really love Jesus can have prejudices and biases. And we need God to enter into that and. and show that to us and break that down. So that takes humility, curiosity. You and then... Hmm. Say that one more time, Jeff. And would you elaborate just for a moment? Yeah. You could be an attorney. You know that? Uh, uh, he, 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 uh, he was saying that these people view salvation through their lens that they were given in their upbringing. And God had to disrupt that. God had to, again, break the sides of that box out. Did I, did I get that right, Jeff? It wasn't as pretty as what you said. Um, yeah. What else does this say about God? Ron. People, yes, people. Mm. People can be conduits to see entire families reached. Maybe even entire communities. I think Ron agrees with that too. People can be conduits to see entire families reach. We all need the Holy Spirit. Yes. Let's keep in mind here, guys. I know people, people when they see the whole the speaking in tongues part, they're like, yeah, record scratch. That's really weird. What do I do? Let's move on to chapter 12. You know, don't do that. Remember, Peter was shocked when the Spirit fell on these people. Them speaking in tongues was proof to Peter, not to the speaker, to Peter that what the Spirit of God fell on these people, who am I to argue with this? That happened before anybody was dunked in a baptistry. The Spirit of God filled them. The Spirit of... And so the take... What's normative is not everybody needs to speak in tongues when they come to Christ because there are plenty of times that doesn't happen in Scripture. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says that, that not everyone does that. So what's normative is not everybody's got to speak in tongues. What's normative is, is that as followers of Jesus, the Spirit comes upon all who submit to him. And we need the Spirit of God, as was said. We need him. All of us need the Spirit. Anybody else? 
We may hear from God more if we spend time with him. We may hear God more if we spend time with him. Guys, I don't know about you, but thank you for that feedback. That was awesome, really awesome. Uh, Second service has some big shoes to fill. Um, I'll I'll tell you that I'm, I'm at a place where so many folks in our world, and I mean this with respect because I know some of you are here, so please don't take this as a slight, as an insult. Um, I don't mean it that way. That's not in my heart. But so many folks in our world are experiencing a deconstruction of their faith right now. Um, part of it, some people, they're experiencing deconstruction because they realize that the faith and the teachings of my parents were theirs. I've not absorbed that in deep ways in my life. And they're in a place where they're, they want to own that. But it's, 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 a, it's a struggle right now. I totally get that and have total compassion for that. There are people who are reacting against what they see as the rampant corruption in the, in the American church. And they just can't stomach it anymore. It disgusts them. I get it. I get it. I feel the same cynicism. Every sermon that I prepare, I'm looking at it going, what are those folks going to think about this? <laughs> um, I wish I could take away people's cynicism, their doubts, their baggage, even trauma related to the church. I wish I could take that away. I can't. I can't. At least not directly. Maybe by God's grace, we can cultivate an environment here where we're, we'll, never be, we'll never be perfect, but we're totally honest. We're transparent. We own our mistakes and our sin. We do something about it. We defend those who are oppressed. And we become, more importantly, the kind of people who actually do what Jesus said. Jesus said, follow me. And one of the most raw simple ways that that looks is to take him up on what he said. He promises transformation and abundant life to people who follow him. And my fear is, my conviction is, is that the way that the American church has done ministry for 300 years has been to make, to been a, it's, it's like we're, this thing that we come and feed off of. And we've not shown people how to actually walk with Jesus. And so I'm meeting with people all the time who I had a brother tell me, a dear brother, I I love this man so much. And just in a moment of vulnerability, after spending three decades in the church, tell me, I don't know how to put one foot in front of the other when it comes to having a prayer life. And I think that this is, I know that this is the legacy that I and my colleagues are called to speak into, to walk into. What we're doing right now is not enough. It's part of it. Gathering on Sunday morning to proclaim the Lord's word and worship him is so beautiful. And it's a tradition that the apostles practiced from the first day the church existed. But we are not equipping people to move toward God in transformation. And my question is, Respectfully, how many of us really want that? How many of us really want that? The ways of Jesus are going to punch you in the face every day. Not because it's not Jesus punching you in the face, it's our own resistance to his ways that rise up and stand up against the ways of Jesus. The call to intimacy with him in prayer the call to the practice of forgiveness and reconciliation. The call to immerse ourselves in God's word. The call to honestly assess all the things in our lives that we're feeding off of every day, we're using to numb out in front of. 
that's shaping us and making us people who are always in this heightened state of outrage and anger and fear and angst rather than practicing the simple faith of being with Jesus. Feasting on his word. I'll make a couple of comments and then we'll close down this morning. I mentioned stubborn mentalities. Peter needed the Holy Spirit to come in and slap him around. He needed God to wake him up. That it wasn't just a Jewish thing. It was about all people. Nobody is common or unclean to God. Nobody is. Can we hear that? Can we internalize that? Will we repent of the things that we whisper at the dinner table or to our closest friends at a coffee shop? The prejudices and the biases that we have, not just to people of a different skin color, but to different ideologies. Can we, do we have the capacity to repent of that? I'm not saying we all agree on everything. That's not what I'm saying. I have never said that in this church. Do we have the capacity to see our stubborn mentalities and repent and to take a posture of humility? Do we have the humility to embrace the fact that what God cares about more than anything is a multinational, multi-ethnic community that adores him and loves one another? Or are we going to continue to allow ourselves to be degraded by all the messages we receive as we numb out in front of cable news and Facebook that make us scared of everybody who's not like us and doesn't think like us. Because we are being discipled. Two hours of church and a community group will not make up for four hours of cable news every day. It won't. And are we willing to push back against the cultural forces that say that the name of the game is tolerance? And endorsing and celebrating what everybody else believes as though that's not an issue whatsoever. Because if that was the case, Cornelius, who gave to the poor, who loved the Jewish nation, and who prayed would not have needed Peter to come to him and proclaim the gospel. God heard Cornelius, but God wanted more than Cornelius to have some sort of vague spirituality. God's desire was that Cornelius be transformed and follow in the ways of Jesus, that he would repent that he would be baptized, that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And saying that, what I just said right there, is repugnant to people in our world right now. That we would dare suggest that people change their ways or be changed by the power of God and repent and follow in the ways of of our great rabbi, the Messiah, King Jesus. Why not just stay as he was? He was praying. He was loving on people. Why not just stay that way? No. It was about transformation. I heard a podcast this week. I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to quote it here. He says, um, theologian by the name of Kyle Strobel, Talbot Seminary. He said this, and I never heard it said this way before. And then it dawned on me, I'm like, he's right, because that's not in the scriptures. He said, God does not have the attribute of niceness. He's not saying God's not nice, but the attribute of niceness, as we have it, you know, sort of that codependent, like he always looking over his shoulder, making sure we're all good, you know, you okay, you okay, we good, we good, we good. God does not obsess over those things. 
He said, God does not have the attribute of niceness. He says, if you just pay attention to Jesus, Jesus is incredibly uncomfortable to be around. (laughs) When I heard that, I thought, I've never heard it said that way, but he's so right. Jesus was so awkward to be around. He's getting water at a well. This woman walks up and he starts telling her about the people that she's been with and the guy that she's with now she's not married to. It's like, whoa, that is really, uh, (laughs) Jesus, you might want to take her through membership first, you know, and take her out for a cup of coffee and let let her down easy, you know. If you look at the gospel, just read through the gospels. Jesus was not codependent. Jesus was awkward to be with. He made people feel uncomfortable. People were totally and completely loved by him and seen by him for who they were. He saw people. But he's, Kyle goes on to say this. Jesus is constantly breaking open the heart. Constantly. He wants us to see and he wants us to know the truth. And then he referenced uh, the story in Deuteronomy of the Israelites in the wilderness for four decades. And they grumbled and they complained. And you know what the scriptures say about that? God did that so that they could see their hearts. He did that so they could see their hearts. This is not about, last thing, last thing. This is not about behavioral maintenance. That's not what this is about. This is not about cleaning yourself up, coming to Jesus. Uh, This is about Cornelius' house being visited by God where they were. The Spirit entered their lives. They experienced renewal and intimacy in His presence. Hope as God unleashed His hope in their hearts. They entered, they were called to enter into God because God had entered into them. And if you have grown up in the church and the message that has been pasted in your brain has been, do this, be a good boy, be a good girl, and God will love you, that is a false gospel. God loves and desired and craved Cornelius and his family. And he craves us. And he calls us to come to him. And he loves us so much, he's not going to settle for praying a prayer at an altar. That is a reduction of salvation. It is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then we respond to that By being baptized. Why? Because that's the rule? No, because we're living out our identity that I am now totally associating myself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I am a Jesus person now. I'm signing a blank contract. He can do whatever he wants with me. I know that's terrifying. But I submit to you that it's better than our ways. It's better than our ways. This is what God's up to in our lives. This is what God was up to in the life of Cornelius. Transformation. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, as we dismiss this morning. Guys, if God wants to transform you, would you lift your hands with me? Jesus, thank you for your people. Thank you for your mercy. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. There is so much about you that we can't figure out, that we don't understand. But God, I believe that me, along with many others in this room, are at a place where we just realize we are so empty and naked and broken without you. We need you, God. And so I pray, Jesus, that your people would experience your transformation. But I pray, God, that your people would obediently follow you, enter into your ways, practice your ways, surrender themselves to you, 
and watch as you abundantly pour out your life in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Have a great, great week. Feel free to hang out, talk to people, say what's up.